Spectrum Theater Ensemble. Um, so we have our third program for today, uh, which is a panel discussion on autism, army, and the arts, uh, and is about how theater can fill an essential need for disabled populations. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna turn this over to Dr. Tara Devine, who's the moderator for this discussion, and she'll introduce the panel and take it away. Great, thanks, Clay. Well, we're delighted to share this space with the listeners and viewers. We've been looking forward to having this dialogue. And um, so I, I'll quickly <clears throat> say I, I'm a developmental psychologist and a clinical therapist. And um, across my 30 years, the two primary populations I've worked with are post-trauma and uh, what we often have called uh, neurological differences or neurodiversity. And uh, really early in my career, for those 30 years, it was clear to me that just talk therapy wasn't exactly going to bring us all that far. <laughs> so um, since I am uh, have uh, all of my life been part of, uh, for me, uh, um, in terms of the arts, the music part of arts, um, I uh, quickly began to turn to that and um, as a, another medium uh, for my clients and their families. And so across across the years, I just have this flood of faces. Uh, that have benefited and I, I can remember for so many of them the moment when their life began to change because of their engagement uh, in the arts. So anyway, I'll let um, Michael, uh, you would like to introduce yourself and your background to yeah, our viewers. Sure. Thank you, Tara. Mm -hmm. um, my name is Michael John Carley. Um, for I guess the particulars, just because I want to get you know to the meat of this, I would say that um, like most of us who work in the autism Asperger field, I of course have one of those shamelessly self-promotional author websites. It's michaeljohncarley.com. If you need the finer details, you know, feel free to go there. Um, but I have worked in the autism Asperger field as an executive director and a school consultant and uh, uh, a writer for almost 20 years. Um, but the interesting thing, and I think the reason why, you know, uh, it's so much, you know, of great value to me to return back to a couple of subjects on this panel is that my, my existence prior to my and my elder son's diagnosis of being on the autism spectrum, um, my careers beforehand was, uh, I was not only a, a starving playwright by night, but my stupid day job, as we called them then, <laughs> Um, was actually kind of cool. And it was working for a veterans organization called Veterans for Peace as their United Nations NGO representative and for whom I did projects in Bosnia, uh, Cuba, large one repairing water treatment facilities in Iraq. Um, but, you know, being shaped by, you know, vets for, you know, 10 years, um, and this particular organization had a very high percentage of combat veterans when compared to other veterans organizations. And it taught me an enormous amount about just conflict in general, both internal and external, as well as, you know, giving me a really great start, you know, in learning about trauma and the machinations and how it works. And especially uh, some insight into how our country can seem kind of spoiled uh, in terms of what we, sometimes tell you know, our young men and young women uh, that they're going to experience in a combat situation. And then we don't honor our promises of taking care of them when they come back. And that's always been of great disturbance to me. I'm also, my loophole for them, I should mention too, because it's an issue that I've grown up with is um, due to having a father who was a Marine Corps helicopter pilot who was killed in Vietnam. And back then, the kids of today may not remember, uh, it was a very unpopular war. And even as a small mm -hmm. child, you grew up with the iconography of how messy it was from both the left and the right. And with that, um, I'll turn it over to Adam. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. So good morning, my name's Adam Martin. I'm a special forces and civil affairs officer in the US Army. I've done six overseas deployments and I've been in the Army for nearly 20 years. Uh, I have been diagnosed with PTSD during my time in the Army and often turned to the arts to help assuage my symptoms, including performing and visual arts. My favorite visual art uh, is actually a childhood throwback of building with my Legos, which mostly occurs in the middle of the night when I need to calm my nightmares. Uh, but I've also enjoyed performing arts, mostly short format live theater, 
uh, which unfortunately these days I can only go to YouTube for that. Um, I have been a long supporter of the arts, even if my last performance was uh, actually a five minute lip sync montage combining the Beastie Boys and Cindy <laughs> Lauper in high school 20 mm -hmm. years ago. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm very happy to be included in this panel because I recently saw STE's One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest and I was actually very surprised in the way that uh, it affected me. So this powerful performance made me feel like I was actually reliving some of the abuse mm. that I had experienced from my previous commander, not actually combat trauma, but from uh, other members of the US Army that were supposed to be my leaders. Um, and that, that commander was embodied by Nurse Ratchet, for anyone familiar with that show. Um, you know, having these feelings come up again during the show was actually quite surprising, but afterwards it kind of allowed me to deal with this trauma in a more constructive manner and talk through things that I experienced and felt, um, say, you know, with my friends and family, you know, even if they hadn't been in the performance, um, you know, it kept me from being super angry when I talked about it because I could reference characters in the show and not necessarily have to talk about my own personal experiences. Mm -hmm. So uh, knowing the important role that the arts can play in helping soldiers and, uh, and others, because like, anyone can really be affected by PTSD, right. um, my, my own reaction to the show emphasized the commonality between those on the neurodiversity spectrum and those suffering PTSD. Um, because of the strong commonality between the two communities, I feel that many of the accommodations that we can make in theaters for both those communities are, are very much the same. And, and I'm, I've been proud to be working with Spectrum Theater, theater Ensemble to improve the accessibility uh, to the arts for both of these deserving communities. Great. Thanks, Adam. Thanks for that um, rich and um, personal, vulnerable, authentic um, description of your experience and how the arts have been important in your recovery work. Um, I wanted to quickly say to the uh, viewers and listeners, um, we're going to, uh, Michael and I have uh, engaged Adam's story uh, with some uh, questions. Uh, as a way to elicit his experience and help you understand further, um, you know, how to help engage uh, those that might be, you know, in these two categories of uh, neurodiversity and, and or trauma, actually a, a number of clients who are both, live with both. <laughs> um, and so, but we'd like to invite you um, to um, put your comments and questions in the chat box here. And uh, at the last uh, 10 or 15 minutes of this 45-minute uh, dialogue, we think it would be richer, uh, even more rich, if you all uh, engaged uh, as an audience uh, and then uh, asking uh, Adam or any of us questions or making comments. So uh, th thanks again, Adam. Um, let's see. Um, Actually, I'd love to start. If you wouldn't okay. mind, I'd love to start by asking <laughs> Adam a question. Mm -hmm. um, right off the bat that is not scripted. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that is, I mean, Adam, one of the things I sometimes use my theater career as a throwaway line only because it's been so long ago, but, you know, for as somebody, you know, with an autism diagnosis, I know in retrospect how enormously helpful it was to me in terms of not only motor skills issues, which, you know, if you're on the autism spectrum, you have, you're just more conscious of what your body is doing. Um, but also an element which I'm wondering if is also shared through the trauma experience, which is theory of mind. Like theory of mind is basically the idea that you can't understand what another person might be thinking because you just, um, if you're on the spectrum, you think that everybody is thinking the same thing as you are. And I was no exception. I had great masking devices, but 
when I first started in theater and the director was like, no, Michael, the character is thinking something different than you are. And I was like, excuse me, what are you nuts? <laughs> you know? How offensive, and yeah. Yeah, it was, uh, it was a big lesson. It was a big lesson that other people could yeah. think differently. Um, with the trauma experience, especially in the context of things like, you know, the masking devices that trauma sometimes forces us to put on. Um, do you find that you share some of those theory of mind issues when you think about embracing a character? Is it, is it something that could, because I could theoretically see it as being something that's more difficult, but also as something that's really welcoming and accommodating. Um, well, since I, I don't try to act or, or well, actually theoretically. participate in a theater, yeah. Um, but I think having to being able to see other characters uh, in the shows and really helping see that, oh, I, if this is in a play, then I'm not the only one dealing with this. And I, I think that like with, with the One Floor of the Cuckoo's Nest, that might have been one of the biggest examples is that, wow, this nurse ratchet and all her abuse and her not caring or understanding about the patients in her ward. Um, I, you know, I felt like several of the different patients and, and it's just, it really helped to, let me feel more comfortable sharing and not having to mask that kind of thing. Uh, and, and any of the problems or issues that I, I felt and any of the uncomfortableness. Um, plus it also offers a really, a much easier way to explain to other people. If you can use the example, mm -hmm. like, like, well, I saw this in a play and you know, people have been able to see the play and digest it and then saying, and that's how I feel right now too. Yeah, right. Uh, so I think mm -hmm. that kind of character emulation um, and, and use of the characters helps with yeah, and, and at I least think the trauma I've felt. Yeah, you, re you refer to uh, one of the most common um, challenges uh, in you know, and the suffering of PTSD, and that's the isolation, like no, nobody could possibly understand, and maybe I'm the only person feeling like this, and so to begin to see that actually, hey, there is, <laughs> there is someone, and in, in, uh, uh, stories have been written about these people, so sort of begins to open up that isolative uh, entrapment that ke keeps us stuck, um, Right. And, uh, and, and it reminds me of a common uh, technique that, um, that I've used is to um, uh, have people write a story about someone else <laughs> who has experienced what they have, right? And so right. That putting it into someone else. So yes, yeah, very, very powerful, yeah. Yeah, and so like, I think that is very important. And we've actually in the past tried to develop programs that we can use um, when we go on deployments and when we're talking to at-risk populations in different countries around the world, um, you know, if they need to be able to attempt to share what they're feeling, being able to write it down as a play, and then it's then it's just art and it's not real. But if the you know, if somebody watching the play identifies, and, and to use my example, if someone identifies and goes, huh, I think I am a lot like that Nurse Ratchet character, and she's the bad guy. <laughs> Maybe I should stop being like that. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah it sort of great. works for everybody involved. <laughs> right. <laughs> Some multiple recovery opportunities going on, yeah. Yeah. So Adam, I, I'm also okay. wondering if some if there's a little bit of a you know, I mean you, you you touched on I think what is you know probably a larger focus of this conference that we're not privy to, which is that you are able to express things through art, obviously that you wouldn't feel as comfortable. 
and it's really all about the context. You know, you've been taught that art is the place to be eloquent and to express yourself, whereas in other aspects of life, you know, we're, we're culturally taught to, you know, suck it up or what have you. Would you also maybe consider that the arts in general, even if, even if you know, veterans don't really have the initiative either because of trauma or just feeling outside of things, would you feel as though the arts, you know, is attractive because it might be a more behaviorally permissive community to enter into? I mean, for my autism diagnosis, I think that was probably one of the reasons why I gravitated towards it was because it was okay to be weird there. You know? <laughs> right. Um, yes. And, you know, and there's a lot to that. And, mm -hmm. but at the same point, I know that in past outreach programs where arts companies of any kind have tried to, you know, become inclusive to veterans needs and veterans in their local areas, the programs have kind of fallen through because they just haven't really succeeded in the salesmanship of that. And I wonder if you have any ideas as to what people are doing wrong. Um, well, I think, especially with the active duty community, people move around a lot. And so they aren't necessarily there to participate except, you know, a couple weeks or, and then they get sent away to a training exercise or a deployment or even another base and not able to fully get the full effect uh, of the theater event and the art event. Um, or even with like reservists, if reservists are coming from a state or two away, then they can show up for one weekend and have a, an afternoon or an evening to, you know, express themselves. But then, you know, they go back to their hometown and they don't have that, that avenue. So I think that's probably one of the bigger challenges is that it's a fairly transient population that we have in the military. Um, well, how about unactive? You know, so it's not a logistics issue. It's really just a, do I feel comfortable? Well, I think they're like um, at the base in Italy where I was just stationed, the arts director there had a degree in art therapy and she was trying to help get all styles of arts um, from performing arts to visual arts uh, to be able to help the soldiers. Um, but it's also, you know, competing with drinking beer and partying and video games, which have many of the same stimulus to mask the feelings and kind of hide the feelings. And, and then you don't have to talk about it at all. Right. Um, so just getting people to want to talk about it and, fighting through all the other noise and activities is, is probably a bigger challenge if you know, assuming the population is stable in one location. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so um, Adam, one of the things you uh, mentioned in your first sort of descript of your story and your experience of um, the arts and in particular your involvement with ST is the commonality between neurodiversity and PTSD. So um, what, what, what do you see? Can you say a little more specifically about those commonalities? Oh, yeah. So I think I've thought about this a lot, especially in preparation for the panel. Um, and then listening to the, the previous group, one of the things they talked about was maintaining uh, relationships. And I, I actually wrote that down in my notes um, because I think uh, if, if you can't, if people don't understand where you're coming from, um, and it can be, sometimes it can be very difficult to uh, actually articulate your feelings. Um, you know, especially if you get kind of overcome by emotions, you know, no, people stop listening when you just start kind of yelling and oh my god i'm tired of this i can't deal with you people and they're like well we're not gonna deal with you either 
Um, mm -hmm. So I think that it, that is a, a commonality between mm -hmm. the two communities that I think the arts can help overcome because like you said, you can, you can be dramatic and angry and, and people are like, wow, that was, that was very realistic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Way yeah. to go. Yeah, it gets I, applause yeah. in that arena. Right. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I wasn't actually acting. That was totally real. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, so um, it's a place for to sort of moderate that self-regulation challenge that comes both from, with, you know, common and uh, neurological differences as well as uh, um, PTSD. And, Adam, can I ask, can I throw a question at you too? I mean, because in my travels, um, I find that there can be wildly uh, differentiating opinions on what neurodiversity constitutes, especially in terms of what diagnoses are, you know, allowed into the club of that which constitutes neurodiversity. Um, and I would say that we're sort of coming out of a period where uh, you had a certain element of folks that kind of were preferring to cherry pick a little bit so that it was just, you know, the brilliant Aspies, you know, as opposed to, you know, um, people who might be di diagnosed with bipolar disorder or schizophrenia, you know, conditions that really could use a good PR firm behind them to combat stigma that, I mean, I remember what it was like 20 years ago to have autism or Asperger's and the stigma about that. And that was awful, you know, compared to today. But in those diagnoses, it's almost 10 times worse. And they're starting to take ownership of these words, you know, that they themselves, these communities. And, mm. and I think that, you know, the broader, the, mo the majority of us now understand that, of course, they have to be a part of the neurodiversity angle. But do you still feel or do you get a sense that, you know, is PTSD to even if it's just 2% of the neurodiversity population, do you feel as though PTSD is still maybe an unwelcome member of the club of neurodiversity in certain circles? Uh, I've never experienced that in the neurodiversity community, but Good. what you made me think about was <laughs> that like whenever I tell people I have PTSD, they assume, oh man, special forces, God, that must have been rough. Oh, I can't imagine what you experienced. I'm like, well, yes, I did experience what you see in movies. But for me, that was a very positive experience because I had a great team. We worked well together. We were able to accomplish our mission. You know, despite, yeah, there was some nasty stuff, but we trained and we were ready for that. Um, but like the majority of, well, all of my PTSD comes from things that have happened back home away from the battlefield. You know, the main part being uh, the way my previous commander treated me. And part of that was just believing that I couldn't have some other trauma that didn't occur on the battlefield. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's also really strange and, and even I fall, I myself fall into my own, that own stereotype is like, hey, look, I, I didn't have these combat traumas. Like, you guys don't have to do all this stuff for me. But, you know, it's still, the, the effects are the same on, on my life. And, um, you know, it's really taken, taken a toll on on my well-being um even though it wasn't combat related trauma yeah if we can uh, connecting these uh circling circling back a little bit in connection um to this we were speaking earlier about just the, the uh, arena for expression was ac actually just you know uh, a, a medium for healing you know like wh whereas some of the expressions would not be so welcome in some, uh, you know, social, regular social interchanges, but on the stage or in theater, it, it could be welcome and, and, uh, and, a, and an outlet uh, to be able to do that. And then, and then additionally, what could you say, um, Adam, and, and maybe uh, you too, Michael, because you, you know, when you entered theater, uh, you know, uh, as a person who was experiencing life, you know, on the spectrum, 
that this sense of belonging. And the reason I bring up this idea about belonging, I know from as director of therapeutic services, director of clinical services, a person who's most of my career been developing uh, programs, that fundamentally the, the basis of everything we did had to be, people had to feel like they could belong. Whatever, whatever program, whatever arena, whatever uh, art medium, it, there had to be a sense of uh, belonging that was offered, a sense of community. And so I wonder if, um, if it, actually both of you could uh, comment on that uh, piece. I guess I'd like to tie in your question with maybe, you know, another question for Adam. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, for me, it was two parts, you know, of the theater, you know, there was one part, which was obviously the acceptance being in a community that didn't mind if I was a little weird. Um, but the other part was performing. <clears throat> and, you know, the performing part is just kind of a separate piece that uh, is something that if you have even moderate success at, it's going to make you feel better about who you are as a person, uh, no matter who you are. And, you know, it's a great, great thrill. Um, <clears throat> But I also remember, I'm a sucker for oral history. I'm, I'm a sponge for stories. I always have been. Um, and uh, one of the great things about working for a veterans organization for 10 years was just, you know, every week I'd hear a fantastic story that somebody told. And it was an organization of people from, you know, World War II and Vietnam mostly, but um, you had some uh, very interesting guys actually from the Spanish Civil War. They told the best stories, but I won't get detracted on that. I bring this up though, because one, you know, this was a while ago when I worked for them. And, you know, one thing that you realized very quickly about the Vietnam generation was that part of their struggles had to do with the fact that um, they were coming home to, again, a population that really did not understand what they had gone through. And so not only did they need, you know, the healing capacity, they needed an understanding audience, which they did not have in this country. And you started to really quickly learn that, let's say, if you were French at around the same time of the Vietnam War and the French army had sent you, you know, whether it was Algeria or whatever, you know, might have been going on that the French army might have sent you to. And then you came home to your World War II era parents who had lived through World War II under occupation, had seen things themselves. You had a much more understanding, um, you know, atmosphere with which to come home to uh, than we had. And, you know, Adam, I guess to steer it to the question, you know, when you say the words, you know, nasty stuff, I think in my mind, when are we going to become a society in which you can feel comfortable, um, you know, relaying that nasty stuff no matter how much of a you know secure environment one in which you can be allowed to trust will be maybe more understanding than it is currently well i, I think through well through all the movies and other things you i think you can see a whole lot worse in some movies than most of us ever see in combat um especially it gets up close and the CGI and makeup artists are really good these days. Mm. Um, but the, what you, you made me think about was when I first came back, um, I guess in 2007, um, from one of my tours, I went out to a bar and was telling stories about, oh, we did this and this. And I was, I was kind of proud of the things that we had accomplished, but then I realized after a few minutes, everyone else at the table was just staring at me. Yeah. See, that's mm -hmm. what I'm thinking. Yeah. <laughs> that's where I'm going. That's where I was going with this. Yeah, exactly. And, um, mm -hmm. But I, I think, I think that's one thing our community, our, the United States has done well is trying to articulate that. And it might just be the circles that I run in that, are very veteran friendly and um, most most people have been in the service of in some kind or another even if they hadn't didn't do any combat deployments uh, they still understand a little better so I, I remember going out in 
in New York City several years ago and people saying, wow, you're the first soldier I've ever met. I was like, <laughs> what? Where have you been? Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I, I, especially like in 2004, but that, that was amazing. Everyone's like, wow, mm-hmm. you, you're a soldier. I'm like, yes. I... <laughs> yeah. I look so real. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, yeah. But. I think there's a, an employment statistic that ha- can explain a little bit about that. <laughs> right. <laughs> but yeah, I can totally see that that would seem a little weird. And Yeah. Yeah. What would you say, uh, Adam, to, uh, you know, individuals that are either in leadership of the arts right now or, you know, um, considering um, hosting um some opportunities uh that are you know intentionally inclusive of individuals with neurodiversity and or ptsd what would you say to them about you know considerations as they're beginning to try to host host such an inclusive uh, medium uh i would think that people would need to be ready for a little little stronger language and stronger reactions than they might get from other portions of the population. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll share another story. I went to a therapist back in, I don't know, 2010. Mm-hmm. And I was expressing my frustration as I, as I felt that I needed to at that time. And I scared, I scared that lady a lot. Mm-hmm. And she told me never come back. Oh, dude, I'm so sorry. Was, I'm yeah. so sorry. Oh my yeah. God. It was tragic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. But, mm-hmm. you know, if, if she hadn't been trained or prepared, because her normal population was not the veteran population. Um, so, but if people are going to want to work with the vet, veteran population, then you know they got to be ready that you know people yeah. are going to get upset about things. Yeah, there's and it's a, not personal, yeah. mm-hmm. and like we're not mm-hmm. dangerous. Yeah, it's just a different, uh, you know, different rhythm in the cognitive regulation, emotional regulation, behavioral regulation. It's just like it's it's, it's the wiring <laughs> is what it is because of what it's lived through. And like you were showing up at the therapy for like, okay, well I'm. I'm available to do something different with this wiring, but you didn't meet, you didn't meet someone who could host that. So I, I guess what you're saying is like, you know, for people to be versed in the needs and experiences, if they're going to host these arenas, right. so that indeed is inclusive and, and continues to be inviting rather than another, another place of uh, loss or uh, disconnect, uh, which, you know, is, uh, you know, can be re-traumatizing actually. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, I think yeah. that same can be said for any population or any situation that, especially if you're inviting people to come into it, you know, like you wouldn't have a party and invite people from AA and just have a full open bar. You would be considerate of yeah of of those people if you're going to invite them in, right? And right. just have a nice time talking maybe um you know some nice news uh, sparkling water or (laughs) or food interesting food that people can have and use as Mm -hmm. as the social lubricant and talk about oh where did this come from so Mm -hmm. i don't think that is exclusive to the ptsd community yeah right right hey you guys uh if this is an okay place to interject this there's a great um, question in the chat box and um, we have uh, just a little over uh, 10 minutes is that okay with you guys for me to uh, uh, yeah of course and Tara Um, I think you should answer it too this is more (laughs) your ballpark than ours you know I I think you know uh, we're a village here and uh, yeah we each have something interactive value creation as I call it Uh, so question for the group um, 
Is it known what happens to the human body and brain when they are experiencing art? And does something happen when experiencing that surge of recognizing your own life being reflected back to you that Adam talked about? Do we know why this helps? So uh, this is a question from uh, Beth, Beth Blickers is her name. Thank you, Beth. It's a fantastic question. I would, I would even just say why it's a fantastic question because we're always asking about how trauma works. Mm -hmm. And here we are, we're being asked how well, art works and yeah. it's kind of, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah. A really yeah. cool, mm -hmm. you know, addition to the conversation mm -hmm. that I didn't expect. So Beth, thank mm -hmm. you. you know. yeah, but yeah, but yeah. Tara's going to answer it and I'm not, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> well, we, we actually, you'd be surprised how you could collect, we could collectively answer this. Um, but there's actually a, a name for it in the field. It's called neuroaesthetics. And, oh yeah, I knew that. I yeah. Well, so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's uh, Washington Post did a great sequence, uh, and you can pull it up. I think it's a couple of years old. Um, it's called "This Is Your Brain on Art," <laughs> and uh, I, I recommend you know taking a look at it. But actually, art engages multiple parts of your brain that oftentimes in, uh, whether it's neurodiversity or in uh, post-trauma, they're, uh, they're sort of frozen uh, or they're um, flattened out or uh, interrupted um, um, and trapped, if you will. Uh, doesn't mean that it's a forever broken thing. It just means our, our, our brains are, are wired to, um, I think it's a fantastic design. It, it has a natural wiring to protect itself. You know, as a lot of people know about, you know, the the limbic system, you know, uh, fight or flight, and it tends to contract us in a lot of the ways we engage, both in our expression, you know, our um, relational interaction, and even our physical movement. We get sort of contracted with you know, trauma, and and because uh, and it just keeps coming to mind for me. One of the reasons I was hired at the Monarch Institute for Neurological Differences as director of therapeutic services is because my research in, uh, in, in publishing was on fostering resilience despite cumulative adversity. And so uh, when I went to interview there, I said, I'm not sure why my recruiter sent me here because I'm not an expert on, at the time, <laughs> I was not an expert on neurodiversity. I was an expert on fostering resilience despite adversity, <laughs> and especially with regard to trauma. And so the hirer said to me, we think uh, neurodiversity can be very traumatic because it's a world that says you're living in a world that's not map or express you know information in the same way that you do and you get up every day and sort of with the same intentions to connect or be and you keep running into a wall and bouncing off and running into a wall and bouncing off so uh, in neuro, neuro aesthetics you find an arena like art visual art musical art theater art it begins to invite you and, and this is why, like, back to the topic that Adam um, uh, was addressing earlier about the people who are hosting this, someone in the group has to be prepared <laughs> for what, what this is about. Because you, you've got to be able, it's got, you've got to live in the holding uh, of those things. So because you're, you, you intentionally are trying to unlock expression, <laughs> you're intentionally trying to unlock this frozen part, and you don't know what's coming, <laughs> You know, it's coming out of it in the beginning, but it's like any old uh, faucet or whatever that's been locked up for a long time. What comes out at the beginning can be a little funky <laughs> or quirky well, all, or whatever you call it. So, so, also, so it is called neuroaesthetics, and it's it's an intention of unlocking multiple parts of the brain: your frontal lobes, um, uh, which is you know behavioral, uh, emotional, and then connected to your limbic system, which is your fight or flight and then the movement parts of your body and all of those together, as we know, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And so whichever, whichever medium of the arts, you know, visual music or theater, it all has a part of unlocking those. So, but I recommend that reading, um, this is your brain on art uh, for, to Beth. Thank you, thank you. I would love to add to that also that, you know, we use art as a means of expression where we don't feel comfortable expressing in other particular mediums or in more, you know, socially uh, less unique, you know, situations. And it's especially, you know, 
it, it's tied in to the trauma angle, not just because it's the direct opposite also, but because it's such a solve for trauma and why it's such a, an important topic in this realm of neurodiversity is because people with multiple or whatever, you know, not apparent disabilities are always going to be more cognizant of trauma in their lives than people who are neurotypical. Um, we're the population of people that will have more uh, unreported incidents of, of traumatic abuse. We're the population of people that are going to have more uh, incidents, not just of unreported, but of unrecognized traumatic incidents, because we just don't have the wherewithal or the social confidence to, you know, even sometimes even own up to the fact that something really horrible happened to us. Um, mm -hmm. And the, the difficulty, you know, here is you really can't get a handle on identifying and therefore managing or avoiding, you know, potential triggers, which is one of the, you know, the biggest steps in, you know, in coming to terms with trauma. So um, when that tape recorder, you know, that goes off in your brain that, you know, keeps hitting rewind, play, rewind, play, and you're looking for the stop button, um, especially, you know, for folks that don't have those tools, um, that's an even bigger nightmare than, than those who experience it on a normal basis, if you can call it normal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Michael. It's very helpful to think about. We have our uh, official five minute warning here, uh, yeah. audience and team. <clears throat> and uh, so I think we were given that about one minute ago. So uh, how about um, um, just, a, just a quick uh, sort of, um, you know, uh, wrap up from each of you like what you what's your sort of last sort of message you want to um, cast out whether it's tying in what we talked about or um, or, or your last emphasis you'd like to place out there uh, Adam and Michael I'll, I'll go first and I'll just say Adam you know I apologize because I thought you had acted in a couple of things <laughs> in your past um, <clears throat> it's, in and I, it's in his future there we go because <laughs> I really would love to see you know not even so much as a therapeutic device but because I also believe that you know veterans suffering from any kind of trauma or just veterans in general you know would make fantastic performers because of that need to express and because of that need to be eloquent um, you know, I remember from my theater days, we used to cast people that were so used to being comedians in really dramatic roles because somewhere inside we just knew there was a lot of pent, pent up stuff that could come exploding out. I think of Cloris Leachman's performance in The Last Picture Show um, as a perfect example. This woman who'd been a comedian all her life and then gets one dramatic role and then just blows up the screen. Um, and any ideas that you have about you know, whether your superiors in the army, you know, are more open to integrating theater programs for people that are already in the service as well as out of the service, um, but also just in getting, you know, veterans more involved in their theater communities, not only for the therapeutic, um, uh, you know, value of it, but because I think audiences will appreciate them as well. I mean, there's all kinds of different ways. The easy start is to go with the VA, um, they usually have a pretty good tap on mm. the veterans in the area, uh, but also other veterans organizations like the VFW or uh, Team RWB. They, there's so many out there and there's probably even more that are just in every local community that aren't nationwide. Um, that would be more than happy to, I think, if, if they discover that theater is a, a good venue to help their population, then um, most people are willing to give it a shot if they know, it, if it, if they know it's there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, great. Let's see, I think that um, Clay has uh, asked me to um, uh, turn, turn things uh, back over to him. And I just want to say to Adam and Michael, it's been my pleasure to uh, share this space with you. And I look for more opportunity to do it uh, in, in other places and spaces. <laughs> so uh, thanks, Clay, for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Tara. And thank you, Adam and Michael, so much. This was an incredible conversation. Um, yeah, uh, so it is 2.43 right now. At 2.50, we're going to have a special segment uh, called Meet an STE Member, 
where we're going to play a video that one of our founding members, Dan Boyle, has prepared. And then uh, we would love if you have any questions for Dan about being a member of SCE or anything you want to know about SCE or being an artist on the spectrum, uh, we would love for you to uh, put it on our Facebook feed. Um, and uh, Dan will be here to answer any questions you have after the video. But thank you guys again so much, Tara, Adam, and Michael. Uh, so we'll take a five-minute break and then come back with a video at 2.50. Thank you, Clay. Thanks, Thanks Clay.